Iceland is one of my favorite places in the world. In July, I was fortunate enough to be able to take a 10-day trip to the land of fire and ice to experience it for myself. Walking through the vibrant towns, hiking the trails, and driving the ring road, I got the sense that this is an explorer's playground. 10 days of exploring is just enough to realize that there's a lifetime of beauty packed into this small island. In this video, I will be going through a detailed road trip itinerary, what we did and what I wished we had done differently, and I'm going to highlight the five best sightseeing locations, restaurants, and B&B stays that you must hit on your next Iceland trip. This is how to spend 10 days in Iceland. The first three things to think about will be the car, accommodations, and food. Decisions here will determine your budget and comfort throughout the trip. Every road trip begins with the car, and there are a couple important options you should consider. For this trip, we spent most of our time on the ring road which circumnavigates the entire island, but we also included a small loop into the highlands which required the use of what are called F-roads. The F-roads are gravel or dirt roads that lead off the beaten path and require a four-wheel drive. The roads we experienced were bumpy, occasionally had some very deep potholes, and had some river crossings. So for the specific itinerary, I will say that you're going to need a four-wheel drive vehicle that is a non-hybrid. We went with the Subaru Crosstrek which performed well on all the roads we took, but there are many other options such as the popular Suzuki Jimmy or the Dacia Duster. I will say that it often felt that the destinations that required the F-roads were more rewarding, the scenery felt more untouched, and those were the moments where we really felt tucked into the heart of Iceland. So if this is an option for you, I would highly recommend it. I used a price aggregator called northbound.is, where we ended up renting from a company called Northern Lights. This company had a shuttle service that picked us up from the airport and took us to pick up our car a mile or two away from the airport. We had a really good experience with Northern Lights, and if I were to take a second trip to Iceland, I would probably rent from them again. At the car rental office, they warned us about taking river crossings, and specifically about the roads F249, which was forbidden in any rental vehicle, and F208, which they said was in bad condition. We checked the website road.is to help us determine the road conditions since F208 was on our itinerary, and saw that it was in good shape and wouldn't affect our trip. This itinerary will include F35 and F208. For accommodations, we decided to go with nearly all Airbnbs, which is probably the most expensive option you can take, except for one night where we stayed in a mountain cabin. Other options you have are to rent a camper van, stay in hotels along the ring road, or rent camping gear to camp in some primitive camping spots. The Airbnbs ranged from 150 US dollars to 300 US dollars a night, all of them featured a shower, most of them had Wi-Fi, and some of them had washing machines, which I didn't intentionally plan, but ended up being extremely helpful halfway through the trip when we needed to do some laundry. Honestly, there was nothing like having a shower and a warm bed waiting for you after some long days of driving and hiking. Also, many of the places we stayed were very unique, often a tiny home or cabin in the middle of nowhere, which made it feel like we had all of Iceland to ourselves in the evenings. You'll have the option to eat at local restaurants often, and I would recommend planning a couple spots where you do. But meals are often very expensive, I would say about three times more expensive than they typically are in the US. Depending on the location, you'll probably end up spending anywhere between $30 and $70 a person per meal, higher if you're in a major town. Alternatively to eating out, you can shop at the local grocery stores like Bonus or Netto to decrease your cost. Day one, settling into Reykjavik. We took off from Denver on the seven hour flight to Keflavik Airport. We landed at Keflavik Airport and picked up our car. Then we drove 45 minutes to our BNB in Reykjavik to drop off our bags and take a quick coffee break before exploring the city. Reykjavik is the capital and most populated city of Iceland and home to some of the most recognizable landmarks such as Hallkrimskirkja, the Lord of the Rings Looking Church, the Rainbow Road nearby, the Harpa Concert Hall, and the Sun Voyager. All of these landmarks are all fairly close and we parked the car and walked between all of them in an afternoon and had dinner in the city at a restaurant called Islenski Barin which featured menu items such as whale, puffin, and lamb. 
I went with the lamb. If I were to go again, I would make sure to get tickets to a concert at Harpa and also the world-renowned lava show. Day two, the golden circle. Before we started out on our second day, we stopped by the Reykjavik Harbor one last time to eat breakfast at the oldest operating restaurant in Iceland called Kaffe Vagnin. On our second day, we traveled to an area in the Southern Highlands known as the Golden Circle. Our first stop was a volcanic crater called Kerith, featuring green vegetation against its red volcanic rock and a strikingly vivid aquamarine lake. The crater is fairly steep on all sides except for one, which is blanketed in moss and it's an easy walk down to the lake. For lunch we went to Friedheimer, one of my favorite spots of the entire trip. A family owned greenhouse that grows tomatoes all year round, and restaurant that offers a menu based on tomatoes. At the main restaurant you're required to book a table, which we didn't do beforehand, but luckily they also operate a beautiful wine bar and bistro that we were able to get lunch at without a reservation. We ordered the tomato salad, which came with all sorts of nuts, fresh mozzarella, and of course tomatoes. On the property they also breed horses and host shows and visits if you book ahead. I would say that Friedheimer is one of the places that you must visit as you're planning your trip. Next, we went to a geothermal area in Hoika Dalir, which features two famous geysers, Strakir and Geysir. Strakir is the main attraction of this area as it is very dependable and erupts every 5 to 10 minutes, while Geysir has been mostly dormant in recent years. The area is also peppered with many smaller bubbling pools. This was one of the busier attractions we experienced on our trip. Continuing our dip into the Golden Circle, we went to our first waterfall, Gullfoss, which means Golden Falls and where the Golden Circle gets its name. This waterfall consists of a three-step staircase, which then falls abruptly 70 feet into a deep crevice that continues perpendicular to the falls. We then got on our next F-Road, F-35, where we traveled 28 miles north to see Kuitherva, or White Lagoon Lake. There, we stopped shortly to see this blue shack featured in a lot of Iceland photos. Next, we backtracked through the Golden Circle to stay in our cozy B&B in Selfoss, which was a little blue, isolated tiny home with a small deck. Day 3, the Southern Highlands. The next day, we started the day with Highfoss, the fourth highest waterfall in Iceland. Unfortunately, this is the day when we started to get hit with some heavy, foggy, and rainy weather that would last a few days, and Highfoss was almost completely invisible from the lookout point. We then went on our second leg of F-Roads, F208, to one of my favorite stops of the trip, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce. It's called the Valley of Tears, which is almost completely invisible from the road, but as you walk up to the canyon ledge, you're greeted with a spectacular view of a bright teal river flowing through a winding valley lined with waterfalls. This spot is a hidden gem, and you should definitely add it to your list of places to visit. We continue on F208 past these famous red craters to Plauyer, a deep blue crater lake formed by a volcanic eruption that occurred in the year 871, reportedly just a few years before Iceland's first settlers arrived. On the way out, we stopped at a massive clearing where we saw some sheep hanging out in the distance. This is the area as we were passing huge fields of black volcanic rock that turned into green pastures around the next corner where I started to get the sense of how expansive and contrasting Iceland's landscape really was. We arrived in Lant Manalugard, a popular camping area with colorful mountains, lava fields, hot springs, and numerous hiking opportunities. We only parked here for a short while before heading off, but if I were to do this trip again, I would probably opt to book a camping spot here and do a day hike if you truly wanted an opportunity to experience all this location has to offer. Day 4, Waterfalls and Beaches. 
On day four, we started our ring road trip in earnest, starting by visiting a local attraction called the Caves of Hela, which features a guided tour through three man-made caves used by Nordic Vikings and farmers to store sheep, hay, and cook in. These caves are Iceland's oldest still-standing archaeological remains, and the tour was very informative, funny, and will give you a rounded picture of Icelandic history, much of which is still shrouded in mystery. You'll continue down the ring road to probably the most famous waterfall in all of Iceland, Seljalandsfoss. This waterfall is right by the parking lot and features a cave behind the waterfall that visitors can walk through. This location, along with most locations along the Southern Ring Road, was very crowded. For me, it was a must-see for a first visit, and I would recommend visiting all the hot spots along the Southern Ring Road, but for a second visit to Iceland, I might keep this one off the list. Nearby, you'll also find Skogafoss, which you can typically walk very close to, but due to the rain, the river was bigger than normal. We opted to instead take the staircase leading to an overlook where you can view the falls from the top and hike a little ways down the river. About 25 minutes further down the ring road, you'll find Dyrale, which is the southernmost part of mainland Iceland. This raised mass of rock overlooks Renisfjara, the black sand beach with basalt rock columns and also has a lighthouse perched on the rocks nearby. There's a parking lot right next to the lighthouse, but we opted to park at the lower end near the beach and hike our way up. It was extremely foggy here during our visit, but it added a nice spooky ambiance to the hike. Reynisfjara is just a 20 minute drive away, and we stopped there quickly before heading to our cabin for the night in Thakil. The road to Thakil leads up in the direction of the volcano Katla and was extremely bumpy and a little washed out due to the rain. But arriving at Thakil, you find yourself in an isolated pocket with a spot for camping, cabins, and hiking that makes you feel like you're really in the heart of Iceland. We chose to stay in one of the cabins, which had a bathroom, a bunk bed, and a small kitchenette. It got very cold at night, and if you choose to stay here, although there was a heater in the cabin, I wouldn't stay here without bringing a sleeping bag or at least a very thick blanket to stay warm. Although it was rainy when we were there, this was probably one of my favorite spots, and I would love to visit again and slot more time here for hiking and exploring. Day 5. Canyons and Glaciers On day 5, we continued our journey along the ring road to Hjörlifshövdi, to see the Yoda cave. And honestly, it wasn't until I actually saw the cave that I realized it was named after Yoda from Star Wars. This cave opens up to a black sand beach and is framed by sheer cliff walls on either side. We even saw a couple taking some wedding photos there. Fathra Kliuvir, or Feather River Canyon, was our next destination on the Ring Road, which features steep walls and a winding river running through the canyon. Here, you can hike along the edge of the canyon until you reach an overlook positioned opposite a waterfall feeding into the river. Fun fact, Icelandic authorities closed this location to the public after Justin Bieber's music video I'll show you caused a surge of tourist visitors. On our way to our next destination, we found a little cafe in a repurposed farmhouse across from a cliff with a waterfall. Walking inside, it felt like you were dropped in someone's living room, and we took a short break to have some coffee. This is a good time to note that if you're tempted to stop at a place that looks interesting and it wasn't planned on your itinerary, it's probably worth it to take the time to stop, as these were some of the most rewarding places to take a break from the driving and hiking. We continued down the ring road to two glaciers called Skatrafjell and Svinnesfjellsjökull, which can be seen from far, far away on the approach, which gives you an incredible perspective of the sense of scale and power of these glaciers as you can see the path they've carved through the mountains. Here, we caught our first glimpse of actual sky in a while as the clouds and fog cleared for a moment, prompting us to pause for a quick celebratory photo op before continuing to the glaciers. We took the time here to hike down to Svinnesfjellsjökull, which takes you directly to the foot of the glacier. The texture of these glaciers is stunning, and if you listen closely, you can hear the water flowing as the ice cracks and melts. A short way down the road, there's also another glacier that's worth seeing called Fjallsarlag. On our way to our stay for the night in Hup, we visited Diamond Beach, where the current from the ocean flows into a glacial lagoon, pushing around huge chunks of ice in a circle. This is also where you can see ice chunks washed up on the black beach. 
I didn't notice it at the time, but there was a sneaky seal that was playing among the ice chunks. We arrived in Hup, a small fishing town, and had dinner at a restaurant called Pack House. I'll also note here that many of the grocery stores, gas stations, and restaurants close very early all over Iceland, some places closing as early as 5 or 6 p.m., so planning places to get food or snacks should be done as early as possible in the day. Day 6. The Eastern Edge. Our first stop on day 6 was Vestrahorn, where we stopped at the Viking Cafe for a coffee before heading to the lighthouse positioned at the very end. The hike to the lighthouse was calm and provided a nice start to our day. Vesterhorn is also home to this black sand beach with these very characteristic mounds of plants near the road. It also had a small Viking village, which was built as a film set for a movie that was never shot, which you can visit for a fee. Vesterhorn unofficially marks the end of the southern edge of the Ring Road, and from here on our stops got farther apart. We listened to Icelandic folk stories and podcasts on the way, which helped us stay in touch with the landscapes as we drove. The next stop was the town of Seydisfjordr. On the way there, our GPS took us off the ring road to take a shortcut through the mountains, which ended up being the most beautiful stretch of road on the entire trip. This route led us up a valley with mountains on either side and waterfalls seemingly every few miles. We stopped at one waterfall called Folaldafoss, which had a rest area and a hiking trail down to the base of the waterfall. Definitely add this route to your itinerary and visit this waterfall. I think if I were planning this trip a second time, I would try and plan to spend more time exploring this area and finding some good hiking trails on the east edge. We arrived in Seydisfjordr, which is a small coastal town with several waterfalls and stopped at a restaurant bar for late lunch. This town is known for their old wooden buildings and vibrant cultural scene. This is one of the spots I would try and stay in on my second visit there to spend some time in the city. Our final sightseeing stop on day six was Studlagil. On the way, we saw some goats running on the side of the road, and for some reason, this area had the highest number of sheep wandering onto the road and munching on gravel across the entire trip. Studlagil is a canyon known for its unusual concentration of basalt rock columns, so many that it feels like you're in a game of Minecraft. There's a waterfall very close to the parking lot, and then a healthy hike down to the river running through the canyon. Here I saw some curious sheep that were interested in my drone. By the time we were done with Studlagil, restaurants and shops were closed, so we headed to our B&B in Flotstadstjeraf. This tiny wooden home was clean and welcoming, and it sat all alone down some random dirt roads, making it feel like we had the whole island to ourselves. Day 7 the northeast. Next we went to Kerir Geothermal Area, which is an area of steam vents, bubbling mud pots, and mineral deposits. The area smelled very strongly of sulfur, and the steam and sounds coming out of the ground gave the feeling of visiting another planet entirely. A 10 minute drive down the road brought us to Kraflaviti Crater, a 300 meter in diameter crater filled with blue turquoise water. The crater is seated right next to a geothermal power station, creating plumes of white steam nearby. There's actually quite a lot packed into this area. We found a parking lot next to a thermal spring called Krotakyu. It's an ancient lava cave that was once used for bathing. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to go into that pool anymore. Also nearby, there's a massive ring volcano called Kerfjall that you can hike to the top of and around the ring. For the night, we stayed in a small town called Luger, on a road literally named a local road in Luger. In town, we found a restaurant called Dalakofin, and for the first time, we were able to order a traditional Icelandic meat soup, which I think is typically made with lamb, but ours was made with mutton. It tasted a little tangy and was pretty much just a vegetable stew, which was the perfect warm meal to end our chilly day. Day 8, the Northwest. On day 8, we continued down the ring road and made our first stop at Godafoss, which is a magnificent three-part waterfall that curls around in a semicircle and features two prominent crags that split the falls into its three parts. Here, there are two parking lots, one on the east side and one on the west side. We went to the east side first, where you can walk down to the river at the base of the falls, 
and then we hiked back over to the nearby bridge onto the west side, which has a better viewing angle of the falls. For lunch, I would highly recommend visiting the city of Akureyri, a fishing town that is the fifth most populous city in Iceland. This city felt a little like Reykjavik of the north. There were some really nice walking malls, and we decided to have lunch at the restaurant Ketli Café, which was positioned neatly inside the Akureyri Art Museum. This town earns a spot on my favorite spots to visit in Iceland, and if I was planning this trip again, I would try and find a place to stay in the city and explore more of what this town has to offer. The Ring Road will then take you through an expansive valley where we chose to stop at Oxnathaler, where there's a small parking lot that overlooks the birthplace of the Icelandic poet Jonas Hallgrimsson. We then took a road branching north off the Ring Road to Grafarkirka, the oldest church in Iceland. Taking the short grassy trail up to the church, you can enter the circular walls where you'll find the church covered in turf and a couple headstones positioned under the tree. The church itself sits in the middle of the vast valley guarded by mountains on either side and offers a calming and breathtaking atmosphere. This instantly became one of my favorite spots in Iceland, and I would say that this is a must-visit spot if you're planning on being on the northern edge of the Ring Road. From here, we headed towards Kvitsikir, which continues down the Ring Road and takes another branch north. Here, you'll find a parking lot and a nearby lookout point overlooking the basalt rock stack that some people say resembles a drinking dragon. We stayed the night at our B&B in Perthartalur, which was a beautiful cabin with two levels and offered a beautiful view of the mountains from the front porch. Day nine, the West Fjords. On day nine, we entered the West Fjords, which is marked by winding roads along the coast leading through the mountains, most of which were often dirt and gravel. It was a long way to our next stop in Tinjani, which is the largest waterfall in the West Fjords and leads down to a staircase of six smaller waterfalls. You can hike the trail right up to the base of Dinjani, so close that you can touch the water coming off it. If you look northwest from the top, you have a great view of the nearby ocean inlet. From there, we went to the old crash boat Gardar BA-64, the oldest steel ship in Iceland, which now rests on the beach in front of a mountain waterfall. If I were to plan this trip again, I would make sure to visit two spots in between, Reykjar Fjörður Log Hot Pool and the abandoned barn Fosfjörður. We continued west to probably the most characteristic spot of the West Fjords, Latrebjörg. Here you can take the trail up right along the edge of the fjords overlooking the ocean crashing onto the black rocks below. All along the way there are thousands of birds nesting on the side of the cliffs, including puffins and a wide variety of other birds. This is definitely a must visit if you're taking a route through the West Fjords. We continued south to the Red Sand Beach, Raudasander, one of the only beaches without black sand in Iceland. From the approaching road that cuts across the mountain, you can view Raudasander from up high, which will give you the best view of the ocean mingling with the red sand in a unique and elegant spiral pattern. Here we backtrack to Talknafjörður, to our stay for the night in a gray cabin perched at the edge of town with a porch facing the mountain and an ocean inlet. Definitely one of our best picks for Airbnbs across the entire trip. Day 10, Snifilis Peninsula. For day 10, our last day in Iceland, we decided to keep the stops light as we made our way back towards Reykjavik. We headed to the Snifilis Peninsula for our final stop at Kirkjafell probably the most famous mountain in all of Iceland. Surprisingly, Kirkjafell was a lot smaller than I had imagined, but with this iconic waterfall in the foreground, it makes for a great photo op. If you have more energy than we did at this point, there are some really good spots to visit in the Snæfellsjökull Peninsula, such as the mountain Snæfellsjökull, Ruthfeldskjú Gorge, or the Svartloft Lighthouse. The next day, it was off to the airport to return the car and getting ready for the flight home. Out of all the places we visited, ate, and stayed, here are our top five that may not be on your typical Iceland list. For top five stays, number five is the B&B in Selfoss, the tiny blue home with the deck. Number four is the B&B in Berthardalur, the cabin with two levels and a hot tub in the guest house. 
Number three is the B&B in Flostas Sierra, the wood cabin placed on farmland in the middle of nowhere. Number two is Thakil, the cabin at the small clearing at the base of the volcano Katla. And number one is the B&B in Toknafjörður, the cozy cabin at the edge of town overlooking the ocean. For top five places, number five is Dinjandi, the largest waterfall in the West Fjords. Number four is Lantra Bjarg, the area that most embodies the feeling of the West Fjords. Number three is Falal de Foss, the little known waterfall on the most beautiful road on the East Coast. Number two is the Valley of Tears, the hidden gem of the Southern Highlands. And number one is Grafa Kirke, the oldest church in Iceland. For top five restaurants, number five is Hamrafras Cafe, the cafe in the repurposed farmhouse. Number four is Café Vagnin, the oldest operating restaurant in Iceland. Number three is Islenski Barin, the highly rated restaurant with authentic Icelandic cuisine in Reykjavik. Number two is Friedheimer, the tomato greenhouse with excellent salads and atmosphere. And number one is Ketle Café for its food and its positioning inside the Akureyri Art Museum. I'm grateful for how much we were able to see on our 10-day trip, but there are still some things I feel like we missed, which I would definitely hit on your trip. Number three is getting ice cream. Ice cream is very special for Icelandic people who have an entire word, isbjöltr, which literally means ice cream road trip. Number two is the world-renowned lava show in Reykjavik, and number one is the numerous hot springs Iceland has to offer. Here's the price breakdown for the trip in US dollars. Keep in mind that this is for two people in late July. For the car rental, we spent $13.50, which includes one of the insurance packages that the rental place had to offer, as well as a fee for losing the front license plate in a river crossing. Accommodation was $23.50, which I think you could probably cut in half if you mixed in some camping spots strategically with the B&Bs. Food was $6.70, gas was $5.20, and parking fees were $100 bringing the total for the trip just under 5,000. Thank you for letting me share my trip with you, which holds a special place in my heart. I tried my best at the Icelandic pronunciations, but I'm sure I inevitably butchered some of the names. Let me know in the comments what your must-see places in Iceland are. If you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, kindly like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.